Whenever I have done a baptism, I've always had one person, and I know this may sound strange, but I've always had one person on bug patrol. Once the baptistry was filled and it had time to just sit for a little while, I wanted someone who would look to see if we had any floaters. I mean, I don't care if it is a young person or an older person. When you're entering into those waters of baptism, the last thing you want to see are, are two dead crickets floating and one cockroach that still seems alive and appears to be doing the breaststroke. What you want in that moment is something that, that symbolizes renewal. You want something that reflects a spirit of, of refreshment. When you enter those waters, you want to have an experience that is life-giving. Could it be life-giving if there's a dead bug in the water? Yes. But whatever we can do to help bring forth the, the beauty of that symbol is important. As we reflect this morning on water and some of the imagery found in Scripture in regard to life-giving water, let us listen to Stephanie as she helps center our service of worship. I say that I like having someone on bug patrol, but there was one time when I did not have somebody on bug patrol. It was when I was in Venezuela on a mission trip, and I was invited to participate in the baptisms at that church we were serving. And there were going to be more than a dozen people, and I was honored to be asked. I was told to dress up, even though I'd be entering the waters, dress pants, button down, a tie, and and so I did, but when I arrived on scene, I was kind of taken back. It was a swimming pool, 
but it was a swimming pool that had not been used in over a year, a swimming pool that hadn't been cleaned in I don't know how long. It was a disgusting shade of green. And when I stepped into the waters, the, the bottom of the pool had like two inches of just muck on it. And there were floaters, not just bugs, there was other stuff. I don't know what it was. And yet we did all these wonderful baptisms. And later that day, the host pastor preached a sermon using John's gospel when Jesus talks about living water. And the pastor talked about how out of something like that swimming pool, out of that mess, out of that muck, how God could bring forth something wonderful, how God could bring forth new life. And it was a powerful image. But if given the choice, I want to do whatever I can to make sure that those waters symbolize something that is refreshing, that it portrays an important message that the waters of life given to us in the life of Jesus Christ are something that truly are refreshing and life-giving. Let us join our voices now in song. Oh, 
Let us go to God in prayer. O oh Lord God, when was the last time we really thought about the whole human race and thought about each person as one of your beloved children? We may claim one another as members of your holy family, but do we act that way? We know the golden rule and often speak about loving our neighbor but there are days when the language of our lips does not match the goodness of your word. Forgive our sharp and insensitive language and lead us, lead us to the pure waters of your grace. These prayerful thoughts are offered in the name of Jesus, believing that faithfulness to you is found through his example and through the power of the living spirit who met us in the waters of baptism, and who meets us today in this service of worship. Amen. Well, today we come together to celebrate a good word, a good word about a God who loves us, a good word about a God who forgives us, a good word about a God who promises us new life and invites us to take that good word into the world so that it might change the world. I say welcome. Welcome to Cypress Creek Christian Church and this online service. I'm glad that you have chosen to join in this time. And I pray that the blessings you receive in this time of worship are blessings that follow you throughout this coming week. I am excited about a study that is coming up the end of this month. It's a six-week study. We're going to do three separate sessions of it. It'll start on September 30th, that is a Wednesday, an 11 o'clock session, a 7 p.m. session, and then on Thursday, which is October 1st, there will be a 6 p.m. session. They'll run for an hour and 15 minutes, and again, it's a six-week study. It is based upon Dr. Amy Jill Levine's new book, Sermon on the Mount. I think it will be an exceptional study. The book is wonderful. Now, don't go out and buy it online yet. Come by the church. Yesterday, there was a, a time to swing by the church for a book and a prayer. You can do it again today from noon to 1.30. Reverend Paula Gambala is going to be there at the church, and you can pick up a book. And if you'd like, a quick prayer as well. Or this coming Thursday from 6 to 7.30, you can swing by the church for a minute, buy one of the books, and have a prayer. Books are $14, but as we always say, don't let money be a hindrance from your participation. We want as many people to participate. And finally, there is a place online to sign up. It went out in the highlights this morning. It went out in the highlights earlier this week. A place for you to say whether you're coming to the Wednesday morning, the Wednesday evening, or the Thursday study. And because the church bought 50 copies of the book, Dr. Amy Jill Levine has said she will do an hour-long Zoom call with our congregation. And I think that will be wonderful, an opportunity for us to hear a little bit more in depth on maybe some idea, but also to ask some questions of AJ. That's what she wants us to call her. Make sure that you think about where you want to participate in this study, get signed up, and get the book. Today we continue in the book of James. We've been talking about it now for a couple of weeks, both in worship, but also in my daily devotionals. Today we're going to be looking at chapter 3, the first 12 verses. I invite you to hear these words. My brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers, because we know that we teachers will be judged more strictly. We all make mistakes often, but those who don't make mistakes with their words have reached full maturity. Like a bridled horse, they can control themselves entirely. When we bridle horses and put bits in their mouths to lead them wherever we want, we can control their whole bodies. Consider ships. They are so large that strong winds are needed to drive them. But pilots direct their ships wherever they want with a little rudder. In the same way, even the tongue is a small part of the body, yet it boasts wildly. 
Think about this. A small flame can set a whole forest on fire. The tongue is a small flame of fire, a world of evil at work in us. It contaminates our entire lives. Because of it, the circle of life is set on fire. The tongue itself is set on fire by the flames of hell. People can tame and already have tamed every kind of animal, bird, reptile, and fish. No one can tame the tongue, though. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we both bless the Lord and Father and curse human beings made in God's likeness. Blessing and cursing come from the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, it should not be this way. Both fresh water and salt water don't come from the same spring, do they? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree produce olives? Can a grapevine produce figs? Of course not. And fresh water doesn't flow from a salt water spring either. May these words offered today be for us a living word, a living word from which we can draw what is life-giving for us and what will be life-giving for the world. Now let us join together in song. praise and glory be given to you and given to the good news brought to us in Jesus Christ. May ancient words flow with the sustenance of life, flowing like a stream into our lives this day. Amen. In the old TV show, uh, West Wing,
There is a scene where the president, President Bartlett, is bringing on a new White House staff person. The new staff person's name is Will Bailey. And the president says to Will, there is a promise that I ask everyone who works here to make. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Do you know why, the president asked Will? And without hesitation, Will responded, because it's the only thing that ever has. Because it's the only thing that ever has. I agree. And I think if you look at human history, at moments of change, I mean, real and lasting change, what you find is a group of committed and passionate people who were the catalyst for that change. Well, as people of faith, as those of us who claim to follow Jesus, we're committed, we're passionate, are we not? And yet I think we have a difficult time determining where to begin when it comes to change. We don't know exactly where to start with this idea. Now, some people will point to the, to the worship series that we concluded a few weeks back on habits. They will say, if you want to change a certain behavior, look at the habits that uphold that behavior. You change the habits, and the behavior will follow. And I would agree with that idea, but today, with this sermon, I want us to take a step back and think even more basic than habits. I want us to focus our attention on language. I believe language is much more impactful than most people think. What we say, how we say it, what other people say, and how we receive those words shape us in ways that, if we are not mindful, we may not realize. There is something called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, and it suggests that linguistics the language one uses determines one's thoughts. Some suggest it even goes further than that, that, that the language one uses determines one's actions and how one exists in the world. Well, there was a movie that came out a while back called Arrival that was based upon this hypothesis. It's a, a sci-fi movie that I was just fascinated by. It is a, an alien encounter. And the government determines that, well, they need someone who specializes in linguistics because they want to try to understand the alien language. And so they bring this professor on board. And, and she early on really struggles with the language because what she determines is that the alien language is non-linear. Our language is linear. There's a beginning and an end to a point. And we can even determine if, the, if there's a capital letter and, and then a period, there's the beginning and, and there's the end of, of the thought. But when there is no beginning or end, when it's nonlinear, where do you even jump in with the language? And then as she began to grow with the language, she recognized that things like cause and effect to communicate that, you need linear language. And if the language cannot communicate cause and effect, do the aliens even understand cause and effect? Well, as she continues to grow into the language, she begins to dream in the language, and she learns that there isn't a past or a present or future tense because, well, that requires a concept of time, and time is linear, is it not? Well, as she dreams their language and lives their language, it does not only shape her thoughts, but it, it shapes how she exists in this world. And suddenly she is able to exist at multiple times in time at the same time. And yet it's not at multiple times in time because that's a linear thought. And suddenly she's existing in a non-linear world. Now, I know the movie takes the hypothesis to the extreme, and I love that. But it also got my attention, and I started reading 
all kinds of research papers on this hypothesis and come to find out the, the Hopi language, it doesn't have a past or a present or future tense. It is less concerned about when something happened and more concerned about how it happened and the who that was present. For instance, that chair. How did I come to know that chair? Was it first person? Did I just kind of fall upon the chair and sit down and go, yep, this is a chair? Or did someone lead me to that chair and invite me to sit down? Or, or was it just a part of the common knowledge of the culture? Well, if you are more concerned about the how or the who versus the when, that shapes your thinking. And I would suggest it also shapes how you live and how you act and how you exist in the world. I mean, if somebody says, oh, I really like that painting. In English, I might say something like, you know, I picked it up a year and a half ago, but not in the Hopi language. You would talk about who was present when it came into your possession. Our language prioritizes time. We might emphasize something as very old and we value it because it's an antique. Or we may look to something in the future that we are looking forward to and we, we prize it, we, we're excited about it, and, and we emphasize that it will occur. But in the Hopi language, again, it's about relationships. And they emphasize the relationship. I believe that that shapes how one not only thinks but how one exists in this world. Our language, the language we use, the language that we receive, shapes us in ways that we do not even think about. And so if you want to change something, whether it's in your own life or in the world around us, maybe it's important for us to take a step back and think about the language we use to describe it, the language we use to think about it, Maybe just a slight change to language will help begin the change that we want. Maybe that's the reason that the Gospel of John begins with the words, in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it goes on to speak about how all things came into being through God. But all along, it is suggesting that this word that was always with God is, in a sense, the tool that God uses to bring things into existence. It is echoing the, the creation narrative found in Genesis 1, right at the beginning of the Bible. How does God create? God says, let there be light, and there is phew, light. God speaks a new creation, a new reality into existence. And it must have been a good word that God spoke because it was and it is a good creation. Well, what kind of new world, new reality are we speaking into existence? Or is the language that we are sharing or the words that we are speaking just continuing to reinforce the world as it already is and just keeping things as they've always been. Proverbs 18.21, the translation known as the message, we find this. Words kill, words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. I like that more earthy translation of that verse. But I think it helps us to begin thinking about the language that comes to us and then the language that goes forth from us and what it is that we choose. Is it going to be, is it going to be life-giving or is it going to kill? Is it going to be like fruit or is it going to be like poison? I think determining the language that we are using, making choices around that is so important. And it's because we don't really think about it. There lies the problem and our struggle when it comes to change. We don't really consider 
We don't really appreciate the influential power that language has. Not only the language that we speak, but the language that is fed into our lives. In Matthew 15, Jesus says what goes out of the mouth comes from the heart. Well, the question for us today is what is going into the heart? In those few verses that I read from James chapter 3, the author uses numerous, somewhat unrelated images and metaphors. A bridled horse, a ship in its rudder, a tongue that is like fire, grapevine and figs, and finally fresh water and salt water. It is that last image metaphor that I really want us to ponder because James says fresh water doesn't flow from a salt water spring. Fresh water, life-giving water does not flow from something like the Dead Sea. That Dead Sea, it's literally living up to its name, and that is not something that is life-giving. Now, the Greek word in the original scriptures that we translate as fresh is glucose. Yes, it's where we get our English word glucose, that very basic sugar that is essential to life. Well, the Greek word was not describing a sugar, but it was describing something that was very basic for life. And if we are wanting to create something new, then we need to recognize the basic things that are flowing into our lives because whatever is flowing into our lives is what is going to flow from our lives. So, what is it that is flowing into your life today? What are you reading? What are you hearing? What are you receiving on a daily basis? Is it life-giving? Or is it like salt water that cannot bring forth anything but death? If our language shapes how we perceive the world, how we think about the world, how we interact with the world, how we exist in the world, and then if we want to bring about change, change that reflects the life, the message, the ministry of Jesus, then we need to make sure that we are drinking from the fire hose of the holy. My concern here is that we are taking little shot glass full of, of the living water why we continue to drink from the fire hose of the negative and hateful rhetoric of social media, of the 24-hour news cycle, of the politicians and leaders who seem to have lost their moral compass. There is an ancient Christian concept called in Latin ex nihilo. It means out of nothing. Something that is created out of nothing. Well, that's the work of God. That's the way God creates. But when we are trying to create, we need something to start with. And James is suggesting that there are tools that are being poured into us in the form of words and language and, and imagery and stories. And what is being poured into us is what's going to be poured forth from us. And if what we are receiving is not life-giving, then rest assured that what comes from us is not life giving. Change, if we want change, then the change that we envision should be the change that we receive and then the change that comes out of us in the language that we speak. When Donna and I first started thinking about adoption, I'll confess it kind of consumed me. It's where my mind always was. Of course, I still had to work. And I remember going to a conference during that time. And one of the speakers was a chaplain who worked at a prison near Cameron, Missouri. This chaplain came and spoke to us about stories that he had been writing down, stories that he heard from those who were inmates at the prison. He was most interested in their childhood stories. And what he learned the narratives that had been spoken to these young people, or when they were young, were often painful and hateful and broken. And what he was suggesting is the people that we now saw, those who were incarcerated, many of them 
we probably shouldn't expect anything different because what had been poured into them as young children was exactly what had been poured forth from them. I remember one specific story that he told about one of the inmates who, when he was just a boy, he heard from his mother over and over again that he was the biggest mistake she had ever made, that he was worthless, that he was trash. Can you imagine that being the language that was spoken to you, especially as a young person? Now, when I say imagine, there are probably some of you that don't have to imagine. It is what you heard. And you know well how much of a struggle it is to get past that. Well, as I walked away from that conference and hearing those stories about some of the painful and negative stuff that was poured into those, into those young people's lives, I began to think about how it probably wasn't ex nihilo. Uh, for instance, that mother who spoke that painful language into that young boy's life, it was probably the same language that had been poured into her. And so as I was driving home that day, and thinking about our future adoption. I couldn't yet picture a child in my head, but I made a promise to myself that I would do my best to speak positive, life-giving, life-affirming words into his life. And to this day, I can remember sitting in the rocker in his little bedroom, the close of the day, reading him his story, and then rocking him and whispering into his ear, Zach, you are an amazing human being. You are this wonderful, magnificent gift of God. There will always be people who will tell you something else, but their message is wrong. I'm telling you the truth. You are a beautiful human being. To this day, Zach will come into our bedroom at the close of the day and give us hugs, and there'll be some nights where I'll hold that hug just a little longer and I'll whisper into his ear, Zach, you are an amazing human being. Well, he's a teenager, and he'll kind of step back and roll his eyes, but my hope and my prayer is that I am pouring into his life something that is affirming, something that is positive, that will come forth from him and into the world that we so desperately are hoping will change. Because if, if only negative and painful and hateful stuff is poured into a person's life, we will never see anything else come from that person's life. And only stuff that will come from that person's life will reinforce in this world what already exists. And yet our language determines the world that we see. It determines the world that we can imagine. It determines the world we believe is possible. And if the words, the language, the story that is being poured into us are, are like fresh and living water, then what comes from us will not only flood the world with grace and mercy and love, it will begin to change the world in which we exist. We may think about habits and other things that need to change, but let me suggest that we need to be very mindful of our language, of the words that we use and the words that we receive. And make sure today, and in the week to come, you don't just take a little shot glass of the living word, but go drink from the fire hose as you read scripture, as you pray, and as you meditate. And know that God will always pour into an open vessel the wonderful and splendid gifts of love and mercy that affirm who we are and affirm all of humanity. Will you join me in a word of prayer? What is it that has been funneled into our lives without really noticing? What was poured into our lives before we were old enough to even recognize it? What are we allowing this very day to enter our ears and to reside within our hearts that is not of you, O God of new life, of new beginnings? of life-giving waters, of life-giving words. If we want to see change in our world, let us be your change agents, empowered by your message of love. 
Yet let us make sure that the tools we have are tools that, that actually could change the world for the better. We must confess that, that too often we have allowed salt water to be poured into us. And though it may appear to be of the same substance as the fresh water, let us not be fooled. For the world in which we live is depending on us to speak words of mercy and kindness, grace and justice. If the change we are seeking is ever to resemble your dream, O Lord, the dream revealed in the life of Jesus, then we need to be mindful of the language, the words that we receive, and the words and the language that we share. It is a daily task, but take us to the reservoir of your love, where there is never a hint or concern of scarcity. What we find there is an abundance from which we are allowed to drink. Allow for what we receive this day, what we receive from you to be what we share with the world. This we pray in the name of all that is life-giving, life-changing, life-empowering. Amen. found it interesting that at the beginning and at the end of the ministry of Jesus, we find water. At the beginning, Jesus entered the waters of baptism. And at the end of his ministry, we find him with a basin of water where he washed his disciples' feet. Water, an image that provides so many powerful insights. The waters of baptism are affirming. They flow over us. They demonstrate and remind us of God's love that doesn't just touch us or brush up against us, but truly surrounds us all the time. It is cleansing us and making us into new people. And then at the end of the ministry of Jesus, there in the upper room after the Last Supper, we find the basin of water and Jesus kneeling before his disciples and washing their feet. A reminder of of how one lives the message of Jesus. The words that he had shared in his teaching and parables are, I think are fully manifest in that event. Let us continue to look at the imagery of water 
as we are drawn to the table today. And then let us receive other elements, bread and a cup, that continue to teach and affirm something very important about who we are, about who God is, and about the world in which we exist, a world that we are invited to help change. We don't do it alone. God teaches us. God prepares us. God gives us models and gives us mentors. Let us become the change agents that God believes we can become. And let us allow both images of water and of the table to help in that good work. Let us now prepare to come to the table. Water, river, spirit, grace, sweep over me, sweep over me, recall the depths your fingers traced in sculpting me, in sculpting me. Spirit grace, sweep over me, sweep over me, recarve the depths your fingers traced in sculpting me, in sculpting me. Over 2,000 years ago, our Lord met with his disciples to celebrate the Passover. During that meal, he explained to them in part what was going to happen to him and what was in store for them in the future. But during that meal, he started something that we still celebrate today. He took a loaf of bread, he blessed it and broke it, and gave it to the disciples saying, take, eat, for this represents my body broken for you. He then took the cup, he blessed it, and gave it to the disciples saying, drink this all of you, for it represents my blood, the blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for the many, for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you gather in my name, do this in remembrance of me. This table that our Lord prepared for us all those years ago, still celebrating it today. It's a table of life, of love, of sacrifice, of salvation, and a table of grace. And it's here for everyone. So please, everyone, come join in this feast. Please join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, by the grace that flows from God, grant me humility and self-control. Tame my tongue that I may speak of your living water and not some foul, brackish evil. Help me to draw from your life-giving reservoir and to speak the better part of life, hope, and joy. And give us strength to do this, O loving Savior, for your own name's sake. Amen. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. 
many beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the Blessed One gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinnerless to the loving call, wonderful words of life. All so freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Wonderful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Gracious God, may your love and our lives come together in a life lived in love. May Jesus be our mentor and our model. And may the world see in us a life that is willing to put love first in all things. Amen.